but he made something beautiful of my life. Thank you, God. All I've had to offer you is brokenness and strife and pain. And you've made something beautiful. And you are in the process of making something beautiful. I spent all week singing this song around the house as I thought about this morning crying tears and pearl wiped him as I put her to bed. And this idea that God makes something beautiful, something good out of something that's been broken and where there's been pain. This morning we're calling it restoration. We're continuing on in our You Are series, and last week we heard about how you are free, and this week we're hearing about how you are restored. And I'd written a sermon, and I'd processed through it all on Monday, and I'd read, and I'd searched scripture around the topic of restoration, and I wondered, how do I explain it? How do you fully explain kind of the core of the gospel, restoration, and that We are restored. How do I illustrate that even? It's so multifaceted and incredible. How do I break it down? And I found myself theologizing restoration. My original sermon notes were explaining how restoration works in a four-step process and how we do it and how we apply it and how we receive it and how we live it out in our life and I even tried to use this example, like it's like a fixer-upper episode, right? Any fixer-upper fans out there where uh, something starts out okay, but over time it's worn and dilapidated and no one wants it. And then Chip and Joe come in, get it? They're like Jesus. They come in and they fix it up and they make it beautiful and everyone wants it, right? And it becomes this incredible, beautiful house and then Target brands it and they have this whole section that takes all our money and... And I had a whole sermon planned out around this. And I thought as I read it and as I wrestled with it all this week, I was like, even that just feels so cheap. It's not like Fixer Upper. It's not like Chip and Joe. That's not an accurate representation. Restoration is so significant. It's so deep. It's so real and so powerful. Lived out in people's hearts and lives that even Chip and Joe don't compare. And Fixer Upper doesn't compare. Everything that I wrote felt like it fell short from what the picture of restoration really looks like. And so last night, about 9 o'clock, I sat down unsatisfied, and I asked God, God, what is restoration? What do you want to say to us this morning about restoration? I have all this information and all this theology and all these apologetics around restoration. What do you want to say about restoration? And I had a sense that he was saying, restoration is not meant to be theologized. It's not meant to be explained in four main points and a conclusion. Restoration is hard to explain because restoration is an experience an experience with Jesus. Restoration is the song I sang and have been singing all week and tried to sing up here. You made something beautiful of my life. I offered you brokenness. I offered you sin and pain and strife and you made something beautiful. Restoration can't be explained because restoration is an experience, an encounter with the one who restores Jesus. And so I began to think through scripture and think about the stories where people experienced restoration. And I thought of the leper in Matthew 8, the man who had leprosy. And he had this disease all over his body and it would have been open wounds and sores all over him. And it would have been painful, and he must have suffered so much for so long. 
and it talks about him in the Gospels and how he would have, uh, with this disease of leprosy at the time, they weren't even welcome to live in the city and in community because it was contagious and it was considered unclean. It was considered dirty and gross and vile. And so the folks with leprosy, this man who had leprosy, was forced to live outside the city. He was forced to live outside of a village, outside of community, with other lepers who had this disease and sickness. And no one would touch them because it was so contagious. And can you imagine what that leper experienced for most of his life while he had this disease? The physical pain that he was in. And the emotional pain that he must have been, not being able to be with his family or even be involved in community life, uh, even worship at the temple if he wanted to. In fact, if you were a leper and you had to go into the city for any reason, you had to wear something that made sounds like bells or you had to have a sign and you would have to shout, unclean, unclean, as you walked. So people would move out of the way and they wouldn't touch you and they would avoid you at all cost. And then one day, the leper meets Jesus. And he asks Jesus, would you heal me? Could you heal me? And Jesus says, are you willing? And he says, I am willing. And then Jesus touches him. Jesus reaches out his hand and he touches him. And I love even that moment in the story because I imagine that even just that touch from Jesus, just that touch just that moment would have been restorative in the fact that someone is touching him. I can't imagine how many years that he lived with this disease where he hasn't had a compassionate touch. And now Jesus has just touched him. And he said, you're clean. Be healed. And the leprosy is gone. It says that in, in a moment it was gone and he was healed and he was made clean and it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful experience of restoration because he was restored physically in that moment with Jesus. But ima I imagine that he was restored socially and emotionally, what, all, all the pain that he would have been experiencing internally, being an outcast, being away from his family, being away from community life and abundant life, and now he gets it. So he's been restored physically, and now he's been restored emotionally and socially. And Jesus says to him, uh, this is early on in Jesus' work, and so Jesus says to him, don't tell anyone yet. You know, Jesus has strategy. He's trying to kind of keep some of his work at bay because he doesn't want everyone to find out and come after him to kill him. And so he says to the leper, don't tell anyone. And you know what the leper does? He's had such an encounter, such an experience with restoration that he runs and he, he leaves and he's like, I've been clean, I've been made clean by Jesus. And he does exactly what Jesus tells him not to. But I imagine the people in town that day, in the village that day, in the temple that day would have been like, wait, you're a, you were a leper. Where's, where has the leprosy gone? What happened to you? And the man with leprosy had an experience with restoration. Or I think about the woman at the well. There's a story in scripture in John 4 about a woman who was ostracized too. She was emotionally and socially, relationally ostracized. She'd experienced a lot of shame in her life. She'd been at the center of gossip in town, in her village, because she'd had many divorces. And she'd had a lot of history, a long history with many men. And people knew it. They knew her stuff. And so she had been ostracized. She had no friends. She was at the well this day by herself, drawing water. And she sees Jesus. He approaches her and he says, will you give me a drink? And in this encounter, in this interaction, Jesus goes to the heart and he speaks to this woman. And he speaks to this pain in her life. He speaks to the hole, the place where she's been seeking value and worth in other places. And he says to her, in this in interaction, he assigns value to her. He says, you are valuable. You are worthy of my love. Let me give you the living water. You've been searching for things that have not satisfied you. Let me give you what satisfies. And it's my love and it will never run out. And he gives her his love, 
in this moment, and he gives her, he offers her living water. In fact, he reveals himself as the Messiah to her. It's the first person that he reveals himself to as the Messiah. He tells her, I am the Messiah. You're in, in my presence. And this woman leaves, and she leaves, and she leaves having an encounter, having an experience with restoration with Jesus, and she's been spiritually restored. She knows the Messiah. She has a new kind of satisfaction. She has the living water, and she too must have been emotionally restored and socially restored because it says in the passage that she ran back to her village, and she told everyone, it says, I met a man. And he told me everything I ever did, and you need to come meet him. And it says that the, the townspeople, the people from her village, followed her, and they all encountered Jesus that day. They all had their own experience with restoration that day. Can you imagine the woman that was most ostracized in that community, the woman that was most left out, that was most disgusting in people's minds, was restored and is now participating in her friends and not even her friends, now her friends, but, but people who, who were gossiping about her, people who were so harsh with her, are now experiencing the restoration of Jesus through her. The woman at the well had an experience with restoration that day. Or I think about the story of the demon-possessed man in Mark 5. And he was so tortured physically and spiritually with the demons that possessed him. He was so tortured that it says in scripture that even chains couldn't hold him down. He was so out of control, he was awake. It said he was awake day and night, just in complete torture of these demons that possessed him. So bad that he wasn't able to live and function in normal society. And so they, too, sent him out to the outskirts of town. And it says in Scripture that he lived in the caves, which nowadays would be the cemetery. He was so tortured, so pained, so possessed that he lived in the cemetery. And then he has an encounter with Jesus. Jesus comes, and when he sees Jesus, he falls to his knees. And they have this interaction, and Jesus says, Be, come out of him, demons, come out. And the demons flee, and they leave this man, and he's restored. And I imagine peace overwhelmed him. How many years did he live without peace in his heart, and peace in his mind, and peace in his physical body? And now, this man who's been awake and exhausted and thriving and, and reeling with these demons in his body. They've now been released, and he's experiencing peace and rest. His soul is free. His body is free. His mind is free. In a moment, he's had an experience with restoration. And I love this story, too, because he runs to tell There's a theme. He runs and he tells. And it says in Scripture that people were even scared when they saw him in his right mind because he had been so out of his right mind for so long they didn't know what to do with him. And he ran and told people about the restoration that had happened to him. And there's more stories. They're not just in the New Testament. It's in Job, too. It's in... All over the Old Testament, I want to tell you about Job because I think, when I think of the story of Job and when we talk about the story of Job, we think about a story of just incredible loss, unimaginable loss, and it's true, it is a story of unimaginable loss. In fact, it's 41 chapters. The book is 42 chapters, but 41 chapters are in unimaginable loss. He loses his children, he loses his livestock, he loses his livelihood, his people, he loses his purpose. I mean, Job has maybe, it might be the saddest, hardest book of the, of the Bible because of the loss that we see. And not for anything that he did. He was faithful to God in the midst of it. 
And so we know this story as a story of loss, but I think it's also a story of restoration. Even in the saddest and hardest and worst stories, we see restoration because in Job chapter 42, in the epilogue, what do you see? You see restoration. Job 42.10 says that after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who'd known him before came and they ate with him in his house. They comforted him. They consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. And I love it. If you keep reading in the the end of this story, it's like they were the most beautiful daughters in the land. There were no daughters as beautiful as Job's. And then it says he lived for 140 years. He got to see four generations of his family thrive after all the loss that he'd endured. Or I think of the Israelites who are key, their story is key in the Old Testament. The Israelites who were a people who'd been taken captive and been enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt. And they suffered, the Israelites suffered, and they suffered incredible oppression and incredible hardship. And as you read their story, sometimes it's exhausting to imagine what life would have been like for them just the pain that they endured, and the pain that they endured walking in the wilderness and and trying to see God's promise to them. But the end of their story is a story of restoration. God restores Israel, and he gives them promises along the way to continue to hold on to. In Amos, there's a beautiful picture of his promise to the Israelites of restoration. He says, The days are coming when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. Like, you've been oppressed, now you'll get to be in charge. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I'll bring back all my people, Israel, from the exile. And they'll re- rebuild, they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They'll plant vineyards and drink their wine. They'll make gardens and eat their fruit. I'll plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I've given them. The Israelites experienced restoration, land of their own that they wouldn't be uprooted from, that had all the fruit and the, and the, the wine dripping from the mountains and milk and honey. And I think of Amy Becker. I think of my own story and my own family's story of restoration. And it's, it's a, we've endured struggles as a family, and it's not my story to tell only, it's all of our, our family's story to tell, so I won't get into all the details, but we've experienced struggle in my family over the years. There's divorce and broken relationship and addiction and death. And in the midst of those moments, I wasn't thinking, oh God, but you restore, but you're good, and you bring, you make beautiful things out of broken things. No, I was thinking, God, how can anything good come from this? Will you move? Will you intervene? Will something beautiful ever be made out of this? How will you ever make this right, God? But now I see, and I've begun to see in recent years, God's restoration in my family, God's pursuit of each one of us in the midst of our pain and our brokenness. I've seen mended and whole relationships. I've seen pictures now and examples of incredible loving marriages, and I'm experiencing my own. I watched my brother worship at the piano on Sunday mornings. I see joy and abundant life in my family, in each of my family. I watched my, my uh, niece and my son play together the other night on the carpet, and I thought, this is such a normal moment, but this is a beautiful picture of restoration. 
an experience of restoration. He's made something beautiful, something good in my life and in the lives of all these people I've shared and in so many more. I am restored and you are restored and yet I still long for more, don't you? I know you do. I know some of your stories. I'm praying with you and crying with you. I still long for more restoration. And so this morning I want to ask, where do you need restoration? Yes, we have it. Yes, we have restoration. This is the You Are series. We're saying, you are restored. It's true, you are. Restoration is already ours. When Jesus came and when Jesus died and gave his life on our behalf, he restored our ability to have right relationship with God. He gave us access. He restored access to the Heavenly Father. And if we believe and we follow Jesus, then we have access to a restored life. We get restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. We are restored, and yet we wait for restoration, and we long for a fuller picture of restoration because we don't see it yet. We don't see full restoration in our own lives, and we certainly don't see full restoration in the world around us. When Jesus came, he established his kingdom of heaven on earth, and he's begun his work of restoration, but it is not finished. And so we all long to see more and more restoration, and we know that there is a promise that all things will be restored. And so we live in this tension of life as a restored person and a longing for more restoration and asking and praying and working for restoration. In Acts 3, Peter is preaching, and this is after uh, the Holy Spirit has come and Jesus has left And he's talking to them, and he's saying, he's preaching to them, and he's encouraging them, and he's saying, Jesus is gone. He's gone to heaven, and the Holy Spirit has come. And he's saying, the reason this happened is because heaven must receive him until it comes time, until the time is right for God to come back and restore all things. And so we know there's a promise, and we saw this promise in all the prophets, these people that would have been hearing it that day from Peter, would have remembered, yes, there's all these promises throughout the prophets in history saying that God is going to restore all things. And so we hold on to these promises like Peter preaches and acts that, that he is, there is a day when Jesus is coming to restore all things. And he's also inviting us to participate in the restoration of all things right now as we experience our own restoration There is a day when broken relationships will be mended, physical ailments healed, cancer cured, addiction gone, heartache relieved. And some of that is when Jesus comes back, and some might be tomorrow as we pray and long and ask God for those promises to be revealed and made real in our lives. So my question this morning again is, where do you want to see it? Where do you long and need to see restoration this morning? And I want to give you hope this morning that the promise we have from God is that we are restored and that we will continue to be restored and see the restoration of all things. God is making all things new. And you heard that in these stories I shared this morning, but those were just small stories within the grander picture, the grander story of God. And the big story of God, actually, if if you think about from Genesis to Revelation, is actually a story of restoration. The whole, the big picture of God is a big picture of restoration. It began with perfection in the garden, where things were uh, good and everything was considered good, creation and people were very good and the creation of all things and the picture of this beautiful garden of perfection where our needs were met and pleasure was ours and things were perfect and then sin entered through the fall, through Adam and Eve, deciding they wanted to be 
God, and they were perfect, and God was not. And then perfection didn't last, and we began to see the effects of sin and evil. And we know those in our lives, don't we? We know, deep down, I don't know who you're honest with, but deep down, there's something in me that still knows, yeah, there's some messed up stuff in me. There's some sin in me that I don't want revealed. And then there's sin that's been done to us, too, over the years. We have experienced our sin hurting other people, and we've been damaged by sin and by evil, and the world has as a whole as well. And Jesus came, and then Jesus came, and just like he did to all these people, Jesus comes to us to restore and to set things right. And that's his promise of restoration, to make things right, to make things the way they were intended to be, and actually to make things new, even better than they were intended to be. I love the picture of restoration at the end of the story in Revelation. Revelation 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he'll dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You are restored, and all things are being restored and will be restored. And those words are trustworthy and true, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you've seen, no matter the aches that you felt, no matter the pain in front of you, no matter the situations that you see around you. No matter the the situation of our world, these words are trustworthy and true that God is making all things new and restoring all things. So where do you want to see restoration this morning? Maybe it's something specific in your life, a relationship, a situation, a place of pain, a wound that needs healing. Maybe you need physical healing like the leper. Maybe you need spiritual healing. Maybe you need to say yes for the first time to that relationship with Jesus, to the Messiah, to the living water like the woman at the well did. Maybe you feel like Job. You're like, things have been stolen from me and taken from me, and I'm tired, and I'm weary, and I don't believe that there's a chapter 42, an epilogue where there's restoration, and you need hope this morning that there is restoration I don't know what you need, but I know that there's a need for restoration in this room. That yes, indeed, we are restored and we continue to pray and long for and hope for and hold each other up to say, I'll continue to pray for you in those places where we long to see restoration. And so this morning, I want us to pray. So the worship team, if you want to come up, we're going to end in worship as we normally do. And We've been doing this week after week where we offer prayer at the front, and it's nice, and a couple people come up, but this morning I want to say to you, do you need something in your life restored? Are you longing for restoration in a relationship, in a place, in a wound? Do you need physical restoration? Do you long for more? Let's pray for each other this morning. Will you be vulnerable and come to the front? And let me pray for you, and let Brent pray for you, and let Ryan pray for you, or let Matt. Somebody will pray for you. If you walk up here, somebody's going to find you and pray for you. We're going to stand together and pray for restoration in the places where we need it. Because I know that God makes something beautiful and something good out of our brokenness and our pain. So we're going to ask him to do that this morning. So just, I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to walk right down here. And if no one comes up for prayer, then I'll come and ask one of you to pray for me. Because there's places in my life where I'm still longing to see restoration.
So why don't you stand as we pray and then we're gonna worship and I want you to come. Take a risk and let somebody pray for you.